Welcome back to Beyond the Uniform. I'm Justin Asiri, and my goal is to help members of the military community thrive in their post-service career and life. Today's episode number 450, Satellite Startup to $500 million Acquisition by Google with John Fennick. So I, I do feel like we we had you know six or seven bet the company decisions all strung together. I felt like we were in Vegas and I was going to the roulette wheel and just betting on red over and over and over again, and and depending on each one of those to be to be right. And uh, you know, startups a lot of it, frankly, you, we hear it all the time, but it's true is timing. If we had tried to start this company two years earlier. The technologies wouldn't have existed for us to be able to build and point a spacecraft to take a pretty enough picture. And if we had come along two or three years later, someone else would have already done this. And uh, just just to be in that sweet spot to kind of thread the needle where I just realized that we just happened to be the right people telling the right story at the right time. Well, a couple crazy things today. Uh, It is coming out to you in June 2022, and my classmates from the United States Naval Academy just passed their 20-year mark, which is wild (laughs) to think that people I know are retiring right now after a very, very um, uh, full career. Um, It's also wild for me because today's episode originally aired all the way back on December 1st, 2016 is episode 45. So we are literally 10 times further along now. A couple things to note on this episode. Um, Since the episode was recorded, John is now a director at Apple, where he has been for the last five years. So that's one change to the introduction. Second one, and I forget if I mentioned this at the start, but uh, John and I know each other from business school. He was in the Air Force, and I like to attribute him as one of the big influences of my taking the entrepreneurial plunge, because right after graduating business school, John, a friend Sean, and I hopped on a plane to Alaska. We took another plane to the middle of Wrangell St. Elias National Park, and we hiked for two weeks in the middle of nowhere. And on that trip, as I was deciding what to do with my career, he told me that if I started my company and spent $10,000 in six months of my life and got a great story to tell over a beer one day, that was money and time well spent. And I feel like that was one of the nudges that kicked me off into this crazy entrepreneurial journey. As always at beyondtheuniform.com, Io, dot org, sorry, dot io works too, but beyondtheuniform.org. You'll find show notes for this episode with links to everything we discuss, as well as 449 other episodes just like this one, all for free. Last thing I'll say is that, um, you know, I'm trying to dip back more into the archive. I realize that m- not many of you are likely to scroll all the way back to these early episodes, but there's so many gems. Even if my mic sucks, even if my interviewing was not up to par, I feel like the guests still shine. And so I'm trying to bring more of these out from the vault to highlight some really cool stories you might not have come across before. So with that, let's dive into my conversation with John. Well, joining me today in San Francisco is John Fennick. John, welcome to Beyond the Uniform. Thanks, Justin. So quick bio for our listeners. John is the head of spacecraft operations at Google, which might be one of the coolest titles in the history of cool titles. He started out at the Air Force Academy, after which he served for eight years in the Air Force as a physicist and space acquisitions officer. He holds a master's in electrical engineering and computer science from MIT and an MBA from Stanford Business School. After business school, John co-founded Skybox Imaging and served as their vice president of flight programs. Skybox provides commercial, high-resolution satellite imagery and high-definition video and analytics services. Skybox raised over $91 million in funding prior to being acquired by Google for $500 million, as reported by the Wall Street Journal. Skybox is now known as the Terabella with, as Terabella within Google. And on a personal note, uh, John and I were classmates at Stanford Business School. We traveled to Alaska after graduation and in uh, Wrangell St. Elias National Park and walking around, he uh, gave me advice that literally pushed me off the edge of uh, deciding to go into found what become story became Storybox. So I attribute him a lot for uh, being part of the genesis of my own entrepreneurial journey. So um, 
John, I guess to start out, anything to correct from that intro or add to it? I just note that we were not eaten by bears during our Alaska trip. <laughs> yeah, not thanks to me. Thanks to our <laughs> other compatriot, uh, uh, Sean McCarthy. He was reaching for a bear bear spray while I was reaching for a camera, and he had the the smarter approach on that. <laughs> yeah, and, and we got photos, so it worked out well. <laughs> um, well, to start things off, um, take us back to the moment when you knew you were going to leave the Air Force. You know, where were you, and how did you approach that decision? Sure. Well, my Air Force career uh, was spent uh, behind a desk. I really wanted to fly, and I ended up getting laser eye surgery to try and become a pilot, and that didn't work. And in fact, I had four subsequent surgery trying to fix the damage the, the, the first one caused. And as a consequence, I, I had to do something else besides fly, and it seemed to me that the satellite and space business was the, the next best thing. So my Air Force career was spent um, designing, building, and uh, operating really large, really interesting, really expensive spacecraft. And, and in fact, my last job in the Air Force was uh, traipsing around Capitol Hill. And it was my job as the liaison to Congress to, to walk senators and congressmen through these big ticket acquisition items and, and how this technology works and, and how it was keeping America safe. So as a, a junior captain in the Air Force, to be able to have that level of access and that level of responsibility was was really awesome. Um, so when that tour was coming to a close, it got me thinking that I kind of hit the pinnacle of, of really cool jobs within the Air Force. And it got me thinking about, you know, what else is out there, the, the grass being greener on the other side. And, and that's what got me thinking about a, a next step. And and for me, the the civilian world was a big, scary place that was full of unknowns. And, and I really thought business school would be the, the right sort of a jumping off point to pivot into the, the civilian world. What, what I love about that is, um, you know, I can imagine having these aspirations of being a pilot and then having repeatedly it, it, it become clear that that wasn't medically going to be an option. And then, you know, knowing more of your story, seeing how a lot of what you ended up doing in the Air Force um, I'm imagining it helped you a lot in your startup. And so I think it's just a powerful reminder that I think we all hit these points in our career or in our life when we were dealt a, a tough deck of cards or we hit a speed bump and it might be challenging to go through that, but you never know what that's preparing for, uh, preparing you for. And I think you're, you're a great example of that, of not, not at the outset of your career getting what you wanted and what you sought after, and in the long term, it really played out well for you. Yeah, absolutely. And, and when it comes down to it, you know, when I left the Air Force, I, I didn't want to be doing space things, building spacecraft anymore. I kind of been kind of sick of it. I kind of saw the sausage being made in the military industrial complex. And for me, business school was a way kind of out of that world and, and into a new one, which which I didn't know, but seemed like it could well be more exciting. And my story, which involves you know, entering and creating a startup and and building something from scratch, I think the theme was it was still authentic to what I had done in my past career. I was building on some unique domain knowledge that I had gained in my Air Force career and applied that, but in the commercial startup world. Um, so that that authenticity, that that domain knowledge was really critical mm. um, as a as a foundation for me to build off. That's great. And um, that was one of the things I wanted to ask about is, and, and you've touched on why you pursued an MBA, but having, um, having already gotten a master's degree, actually, let me, let me word this differently. Um, in retrospect, having gone down this path of entrepreneurship, how essential do you think that MBA was? And you know, I ask in case a veteran listening is thinking of starting their own company, whether they should think of getting an MBA first or if you have any opinions on that. Yeah, I, I didn't know what I didn't know. I, all I had seen is is kids I went to to engineering graduate school with that were in finance or in consulting or in you know high tech, and I didn't I didn't have any idea of what those career tracks and and what those possibilities were. And to me, the only world that I knew was a little bit of the you know you know inside the Beltway and what defense contractors did. And what I needed more than anything else was perspective. And I felt like business school, just interacting with a peer group that didn't come through and do the same things that I had done in my really narrow military channel 
was going to be really critical for me to make decisions about what I wanted to do versus just the subset of things that I knew. And um, I imagine you get a lot of people who ask you for advice about business school. I'm just I'm wondering if you had one piece of advice to give to lis- listeners about that application process for business school. What, what would that be? I, you know, I think for, for vets, it, it seems scary, you know, all the numbers in terms of GMAT scores and the yield acceptance rates, all those seem very, very daunting. Uh, what I didn't understand until I got into school and, and started interacting with the admissions committee, realizing that we as vets are treated entirely differently than the rest of the applicant pool. Um, their business schools really value our perspective, our work ethic, just the fact that we're a bit different in, in a lot of really interesting and valuable ways in the business setting. And as a consequence, uh, all the admissions committee are really looking to populate each of their classes with uh, a reasonable percentage of folks from the military. And that's the pool of folks admissions wise who who any of us as an applicant will be competing against. And so that gave me, uh, with hindsight, I was like, oh, I wish I had known that going in because it would have given me a lot more confidence that I had a chance. And, um, you know, I, I want to talk about how you started Skybox, but one thing that always comes up when I'm speaking with people is that thought of, of finding co-founders. Mm. And I'm wondering, um, I'm wondering, how did you find your co-founders and what advice do you have for other veterans in terms of finding the ideal people to, to really start a company with? For me, I, I knew I was interested in technology, but to be honest, as an Air Force officer, I wasn't a technologist. It very quickly, you know, they, they started to remove the keyboard from my hands just even as a first lieutenant. I became farther removed from the actual design and build uh, and engineering and was more in a program and project management role. And as a consequence, I, I learned what it was like to, to lead a team of people and to work on something of, of broad scope. But the, the nuts and bolts of building things, um, you know, even as a mid-level captain in the Air Force, I, I'd, I'd kind of gone away from. And so for me, it was really important as I contemplated starting my own company, especially a tech company, especially a hardware technology company, uh, to find folks that um, really hadn't uh, divorced themselves from from the building stage and and could um, be my kind of the yin to my yang when it came to uh, building something from nothing. And maybe I, I should back up. Um, how would you explain, I, I gave a very brief explanation at the start, but how would you explain um, what was Skybox Imaging? Sure. You know, it was funny. Skybox started literally as a class project. Uh, I met my co-founders um, when I was uh, my first year of business school. I, you know, I was still interested in aerospace. Uh, and you know, I thought for sure that it wasn't a good career track for me going forward, but at least it's where I came from. So I, I was able to, you know, strike up a chord and dialogue with a, a couple really smart graduate students who were building tiny spacecraft. And it, those discussions, you know, over beers are what led us to uh, put a put a story together and go into a class, uh, semester long class that took our idea which was to build little spacecraft and to catalog the earth, just like Google catalogs the internet and try and take that vision and at least turn it into a story that was credible enough to get an A in the class. And what's interesting is that none of us had, especially me, had any inclination or idea that it could ever turn into something real. It was for, for us, it was an academic exercise to very, to learn uh, kind of the entrepreneurship process and and structure. And it was only at the end of the class when our professors came to us and say, hey, this is kind of interesting. Have you guys ever thought about doing this for real? That the gear started turning, that this was um, worthwhile for us to to go try and uh, attempt to, to make happen. That's that's incredible. I mean, it's um, I think it's just so often that we hear stories or we imagine stories where it's kind of this um, drive and 
uh, vision from God from the start. And it's it's just interesting that you just kind of started without that pressure. It started as something that was, uh, you know, to meet to meet a grade requirement and nothing beyond that. And I, I just wonder, I'm just, not that there's an answer for this, I just wonder if yeah. that in some ways freed up your team to to work more creatively without that pressure, that it was just just um, a very achievable milestone. And then once you achieved that, you realized it could be something greater. Yeah, I, not only was it fun, but none of us felt any pressure because we were going to school during the day. This wasn't, we our, our livelihoods didn't depend on it. Um, we were learning as we went. It was, it, we really enjoyed the, the creation process. And, you know, I always, I told my co-founders, uh, even as we founded the company in my second year of business school, for real, that I'd, I was along for the ride until everyone told us no. And as soon as everyone tells us no, then it's time to close up shop and go find something else to do. The, the baseline set of things that we'd been exploring in parallel, you know, over the last, you know, couple of years when I was in school. And what's interesting is that seven, eight years later, we're here because people kept telling us yes all the way along. Sometimes it took a long time to get to yes, and there were a lot of no's in between, but we always found a door to, to walk through that was open to be able to continue um, building this story and building this business. It, it's refreshing because, um, again, there's this stereotype of just unfettered optimism and kind of blind optimism. And I like you know, your approach, which seems healthy, of just kind of going along without this pressure and, and not even any sort of expectation that this is going to have the fantastic outcome that you did have. And um, yeah, I just think that's refreshing to hear. And yeah, I, I would say there's a there's a caveat though, which is while you know, especially coming out of the military, I, I you know, ever the skeptic, I, I, I always you know tempered everything um, that I thought of and did with you know ample margin, and a lot of that comes from being in the military. You know, we are very much um, demanded to be right at every at every turn, and especially in the spacecraft business where the the consequences for being wrong are so high. And as a consequence, even in, and during the startup formation process, I always, you know, hedged our bets in terms of what we could do or or what was possible. And in contrast, my co-founders, Dan and Julian, were extremely forward leaning, ever the optimists, always, you know, projecting what could be instead of what was or what we had in hand. And in fact, that sort of complementary nature of me always, you know, glancing askew at everything and them, you know, looking through these kind of rose colored glasses perspective, I think really balanced each other out and allowed us to, you know, be pragmatic, but also, um, you know, make a leap, try and do things that frankly, no one else had tried to do before. I think that's such a great plug for co-founders again, too, where you're able to balance each other out and they're, you know, each person is bringing something to the table. And in, in some ways that, uh, skepticism, like you said, bred from the military, that that worked well as a counterbalance to that unbridled um, optimism, and, and and they worked in tandem together to make that success possible. Um, I think there's one other element with regards to you know finding co-founders. You know, finding co-founders is like getting married, and it is a it's a long term relationship. And you know, the, the, we always taught us at school to to work only with people that we trusted. And I and I think trust is really important. It's a, it's a solid foundation, but it's certainly not enough. I think what was really critical for me and what made this all work is I worked. My co-founders were people that I admired. Uh, my co-founder Dan, uh, still to this day, the best salesperson, uh, the most convincing person about anything I've ever met. Uh, just extremely eloquent. You know, he is. It's it's really impressive to see him. Uh, engage with anyone. And then my other co-founder, Julian, I mean, we called him Doogie Hauser. He was 21, 22 at the time, um, almost a savant when it came to the, this kind of technologies, what we were trying to do. And and to be able to work with those guys, I knew from day one, I was super lucky and I was working with folks that had sets of skills that I didn't have, but really appreciated. Mm. And and so what happens next? What's the next milestone? You have these professors from the class kind of cheering you on to make this a, a reality. What what happens next? Yeah, it, it actually went beyond professors just cheering us on. And I think there was something unique about, you know, Stanford and its proximity to Sand Hill Road, where something like 80 percent of the venture capital in the world is located. You know, our professors were able to open doors for us uh, in a variety of uh, venture investment firms that 
allowed us to at least tell the story. And what's really interesting is that our story, because we were building spacecraft and because those spacecraft took pretty pictures, it's a story that resonates with most anybody. And so as a consequence, most anybody, most any investor was willing to hear us out. Now, of course, the vast majority of them reacted by saying, hey, this is amazing, but I have no idea what you're talking about. This is out, way outside my domain experience. I'm sorry, but I, this is not something that we can do. But it, at least it allowed us to engage and get feedback and you know, basically try out the story. And uh, about 40 times, we were either told no or call you later, uh, and, which really amounted to nothing before we were able to find a firm and find a partner in a firm that, that our story resonated to the point where um, they were willing to make a bet on us. And um, that's that's one thing I wanted to dive into is just kind of general advice around fundraising. So so for background, like I said, Skybox raised over ninety one million in funding. Their investors, for those familiar with venture capitalists, these are some of the biggest names: Norwest Venture Partners, Coastla Ventures, Draper Associates, Kane and Partners, Bessemer Ventures. Uh, just an, an incredible group of people and, and and you went through several rounds of of fundraising what advice would you have for any veteran listening that might be about to go through that fundraising process you know looking back i think that one of the reasons that we were able to be successful is the story that we told was not a story about a spacecraft company uh, it was not a story about pictures from space it was a story about disrupting an industry that was what we called was in the mainframe era of very large, very expensive spacecraft and bringing that industry to not only to the, the PC era, but all the way to the laptop era with m many more uh, distributed, smaller, um, comparatively less capable on a per spacecraft basis, but en masse via Constellation really offering something new to the industry. And that's sort of describing a pattern that is kind of reflects a lot of the other types of disruptions in, in parallel industries, whether it be um, mainframe computers or internet and the like. That was what resonated with uh, investors that we told the story to, because while they didn't know anything about spacecraft, they knew a lot about making money in a lot of these enterprise and consumer internet type plays over the last 20 years. So it was telling a story in a way that they could they could understand and they could they could match to previous investments was super critical. And and going back, I mean, what was that like? I imagine um, actually, yeah, for that first round, if from what you remember, how long did that take to raise money? And then what what was that like when you actually realized like you would you had passed that next yes, you had gotten the check to start to start building and start uh, making your vision a reality. We ended up, it was my, my last semester of business school, we'd go to school in the morning and we'd pitch the company, the story, all afternoon. And what's funny is that we were all in some of the same classes and the classes were in large part teaching us about elements of, of creating and, and running a small company. So we would actually be folding in further things that we learned into our deck and adjusting as we went along. And you know, I was fully expecting to go get a real job uh, after graduating in, in the summer. And it was right before school ended when we finally met a investor where we resonated. And we ended up signing the term sheet the day that I graduated. And that was really exciting to know that at least for a little while, we had a chance to go try and make something real. Uh, and, and, and then very quickly thereafter, it sort of dawned on us that you know, we now have a blank slate. We, we raised our initial three million bucks on a handful of PowerPoint charts, and now we had dollars in the bank, and we had to make it all happen. And there, there were sort of at, at school they kind of talk a bit about a playbook, but we sort of felt like uh, we were starting completely from scratch, which was both extremely exciting and extremely scary all at once. What was um? Once you had that first tranche of funding, what was day to day life like? And and I'm always curious too. The the lifestyle component is was this the stereotypical 24 hours a day, seven days a week? Like what what did your life look like on a on an average day? Yeah, there there was very a lot of that. I think 
you know, all of us wore a gazillion hats and we probably, and I, well, I went to work every day, not knowing which problems I would need to solve that day or the next, uh, just a tremendous amount of uncertainty with, with zero structure. You know, I think what's, what's interesting is it's the polar opposite of the military, which every day is, is pretty well subscribed. Even, you know, all of our jobs, all we needed to do was what the previous guy did and their OPR and just do that 10% better. And, and here I was um, really trying to create something from nothing. And uh, as a consequence, it took a, just a lot of um, back and forth dialogue with my co-founders and that initial team as we, we figured out how to chart our course. And I'm wondering with, well, let me, let me take a step back. You know, at, at this point, you're, you're an early stage company. So, so for veterans listening who are thinking of starting, a, starting their own company, you've kind of touched on the lack of structure. I'm just wondering, any other thoughts on ways in which someone's military background might really help them in founding a company and in what ways they're going to have to overcome some, some obstacles from their, their background? Yeah, I, I think in, in many ways, you know, having you know gone to a service academy, ha- having had a military career, uh, it really put me ahead in a, in a number of sort of EQ type ways. I always felt like uh, no matter how stressful the startup got, I had been in more stressful spots and had to make do um, with less. Uh, and in, in my military career, and as a consequence. I, none of none of the challenges that we faced to me seemed, you know, like life and death seemed like uh, they, they couldn't be surmounted. And even then, I knew that the worst case scenario was we'd run out of money, we'd lose the support from our investors, and then we'd go off and, and do what we planned to do six months prior. So as a consequence, I never felt the, the tremendous pressures um, that are often attributed to, to startup life. I tell you that where the pressures did start to set in is as we started to convince people beyond our friends to come work with us, people to give up their careers and their trajectory to take a make a bet on us. I think that was the point around about year two, year three, as we established critical mass from a, from a person personnel standpoint. That's when it really felt like, wow, this is something real. Now there are real pressures associated with this job. So there I there I felt ahead in terms of being able to handle um, and handle what was what were the challenges we were facing. I think, as I mentioned before, I, I did feel like from day one, I was pretty far behind from all of the sort of technical aspects. You know, our, our company was very much a science experiment for those first few years. And, you know, in the startup world, there's really, there's two things to do. There's building and there's selling. And if I'm not doing either of those, then I'm not useful. And so as a consequence, um, because I wasn't building. I was the person out there um, selling, but I was selling a dream because we were still a year or two away from having a spacecraft constructed in space and having a product to sell. Um, so there were, you know, a lot of sort of wild hand gestures on my part, you know, telling a narrative, telling a story about what could be, and trying to convince people to believe in something that didn't yet exist. Uh, so that was a that was a pretty pretty challenging thing to do, uh, especially with in the absence of knowing you know, how with any sort of confidence are our chances of, of actually pulling it all off from, from a building a mousetrap standpoint. It's, it's just what stands out to me is the number of guests I've had on the show already where they talked about how selling and particularly selling oneself is one of the most challenging aspects yeah. for veterans and how it, it is so antithetical to your background of um, only, only do only a promising things that are absolute certainties and always focusing like almost downplaying your own accomplishments. So I'm just putting myself in your shoes and imagining how difficult that would be to be, um, selling just constantly and, and knowing that you're, you're selling something that doesn't exist. That would be, that would be very difficult. Yeah. I mean, I think the last time I sold anything was at Boy Scouts as a kid selling Christmas wreaths door to door. And <laughs> That's that's not enough. Uh, I I feel like you know to be honest, you, you probably have a question queued up about about uh, advice for veterans in business school and the like. And my one regret, my big regret, is that I didn't take a sales class. I and and sales is all about it's about persuasion, but the other half is about expectations management um, of yourself and of the people who you're dealing with. And you know, I I made a number of missteps of either under promising or over promising along the way with potential customers, with partners, and the like. And 
you know, having a framework, learning the mechanics through a sales class, I think would have really helped me out. And I would have learned things without uh, individual trial and error on my own part. That's great. And, and so going back to the story, you, you raise $3 million, you start to grow. What was kind of like the next milestone on this journey for you? <laughs> well, we always talk about how startups are very much milestone driven. And in fact, that's how, you know, startups raise money. We raise money based on the value creation event of a milestone. The challenge in our business is there's really only one milestone to get going. That's putting a spacecraft in space and taking a pretty enough picture to be able to sell. And for us, that that happened at round about the four year point. And we had to raise a number of rounds of funding to get there in between. So as a consequence, we had to be very creative in manufacturing milestones along the way that gave at least some semblance of idea that we knew what the heck we were doing. Uh, so what we did is we ended up um, leasing a Learjet and poking a hole in the bottom and taking the same camera that we were putting on the spacecraft and flying it. It kind of ballparked the same speed to be able to generate imagery like which we would sell. And we held that up to our investors and said, hey, look, this is kind of sort of similar. Don't you trust us? Don't you, don't you see that we know what we're doing? And uh, that's a pretty tough sell in of itself, but it was all we could do to show that we were making progress towards this, what amounted to a binary event, launching the spacecraft, making it work, showing that we had a product that we could sell on the market. That's, uh, that's incredible. It's, um, it just makes me realize like all of the thousands of, of problems you must have had to solve as a group on your way to, li to literally launching these things into outer space. Yeah, and it's um, it, and it's problems that we solved, you know, together. But many of these, we only had one smart person in all the different disciplines that go into building a spacecraft. And so when we launched that first spacecraft, each person that had a contribution to building that spacecraft had a monitor and a desk in our operations center, and they watched their piece of this puzzle the very first time. And each one of those people in each one of those seats their part had to work or we would fail. And so just the amount of trust that was required of these 15, 20, 30 folks that had contributed over the last four years, blood, sweat, and tears to, to make this happen. And it all literally had to, to be strung together and all work. Uh, and to see that all happen and have that trust pay off was a tremendously satisfying experience. How, how far in the uh, the process was that when you were able to launch your first satellite? And what was that, that I don't know, that, that lead up and that process like? Yeah, it was uh, about four, four and a half years into the business. And, and of course, in startup, startups was age and dog years, four and a half years just to be able to prove the concept is eons. And, you know, that, that's what required a lot of the tap dancing with our investors and the like to get to that point. It, it, it's very interesting the the number of these, as I refer to these binary outcomes in our business, even just in the launch process, you know, first and foremost, the rocket that our spacecraft is on has to go up and work. Uh, you know, we've seen recently a number of spectacular cases on YouTube where that it hasn't worked. So we knew there was a 5% chance the rocket would blow up. We didn't raise enough money to have a second chance. All our eggs were literally in this one basket. But just getting the spacecraft up in space wasn't good enough. We had to turn it on. It had to beep like Sputnik. And in many cases, a lot of spacecraft do have infant mortality where that doesn't happen. So hearing that first ping back from the spacecraft was a celebration in itself. And then the way that we build our spacecraft is that we have a door that covers up the telescope that takes the pictures. And that door has to pop open. And if it if that popping mechanism doesn't work, we're taking pictures of the inside of the door, which is pretty hard to, to sell. And the, the day, the moment that that door popped open was another big cause for celebration. And then finally, we had to be able to point the spacecraft at some place on Earth and take a, that first pretty picture. And I remember very vividly the moment when that first picture came down about 40 or 50 of us were crowded around a monitor. And when it popped open and we could see that the telescope wasn't blurry, that the picture looked great, uh, that was a, a very, very exciting moment. What, and of course, what that was, was the, the first picture. photo? Was that uh, uh, Area 51 or is that like a Wendy's or what was the, the target on no, that one? 
No, it's funny. It's uh, I'm actually staring at the picture right now in my house. It's uh, it's framed. It is a, a picture of a random shopping mall in Perth, Australia. <laughs> completely, completely random. But it was that picture. As soon as we took it, we went and showed that to all of our customers. And uh, one of those customers happened to be Google. And that first picture is what started to get the ball rolling uh, for us to to go join Google uh, over the next course of the next nine months. Mm. Well, um, you know, you're very humble in the telling of the story. But what I uh, appreciate about um, your candor on this is just you're just driving the point home. I'm realizing just all of the, you know, on the one hand, all of the thousands of things that could have gone wrong that would have prevented this, just arbitrarily prevented this satellite from launching and taking its photo, and that would have prevented your acquisition. And then on the other hand, I'm just amazed at, like, you built, you helped build a team that under that pressure didn't fail. They built everything to work perfectly. And so it's like this weird juxtaposition of um, an incredible case study of how volatile and risky any startup endeavor is, and just an incredible testimony to the, 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 the job that you guys did as a team to be able to overcome that. Yeah, no doubt. It, it was not easy. And um, let's be honest, there's, you know, there's even in, in your behind the uniform talks, there's a bit of selection bias, right? You're, you're not as much talking to the folks that, that tried and failed along the way. You end up talking to the folks that, you know, through the combination of good fortune and hard work, were able to, to make something uh, somewhat successful. So I, I do feel like we we had you know six or seven bet the company decisions all strung together. I felt like we were in Vegas and I was going to the roulette wheel and just betting on red over and over and over again and and depending on each one of those to be to be right. And uh, you know startups, a lot of it, frankly, you, we hear it all the time, but it's true is timing. If we had tried to start this company two years earlier, the technologies wouldn't have existed for us to be able to build a, and point a spacecraft to take a pretty enough picture. And if we had come along two or three years later, someone else would have already done this. And uh, just just to be in that sweet spot to kind of thread the needle where I just realized that it, we just happened to be the right people telling the right story at the right time. And um, so, so from that photo, you show that to Google. How long was it until the acquisition was finalized? Uh, about nine months. And, you know, some of that is, is that these things aren't easy, especially when you were a high growth startup. Um, and part of it was there was a number of regulatory hurdles back at the Pentagon where I used to work. Um, but it was, uh, you know, there was a, it was a courting process. But we knew very early on that Google was a wonderful fit for us. Uh, we used to count, literally count and worry about every server that we purchased to be able to go process our imagery. And of course, being part of Google, we didn't have to worry about that anymore. Besides that, we were trying to wrap our heads around how do we allow our customers to uh, see our imagery and, and navigate around it and to be able to build on Google Maps and Google Earth, you just solve that problem overnight. So everything about this for us totally made sense. And as a consequence, we did everything in our power not to screw up the deal. Now, there were some really interesting timing elements of this, which is we'd already – uh, agreed in principle on what the deal wanted. We wanted to, to, to have the deal be. And it just so turned out that we had our second spacecraft, which we had queued up but didn't expect to launch. All of a sudden, the, the launch time frame came along, and we were launching the spacecraft before the deal with Google was finalized. And what we realized is that this was only downside for us. If the spacecraft work, great, we can continue with the acquisition. And if the spacecraft didn't work, well, then we're going back to the negotiating table. So unlike the first spacecraft, which was all exciting and, and I can't believe it worked, this is awesome, the second spacecraft was only downside. Oh, geez, I hope it doesn't fail because then uh, this, this great relationship that we've established with Google, could the bottom could very well fall out from underneath it. So lucky for us, it, it, the second one worked as well and the deal closed and we were able to, to come join uh, and become part of Google. And and these weren't even your rockets, right? I mean, you're basically hitching a ride on someone else's rocket. You're kind of uh, hitching your fate to someone else's uh, piece of machinery. Yeah, not just anyone though. These both these launches of our first two spacecraft were in rural Russia, and just the mechanics of getting permission to ship our spacecraft 
uh, over to an active duty missile field to be dropped into an, an intercontinental ballistic missile where they pull the warheads out and they put our spacecraft in. Uh, just a crazy set of stories in itself just to be able to get our spacecraft in space. It's just so wild. I mean, I think that the the military background is so great for this because I, I like am literally looking. I'm like sitting on the edge of my chair and just feeling <laughs> like feeling so much stress from everything you're describing of just every yeah. milestone along the way. And so, um, yeah, I just can only imagine. And and um, one thing I wanted to ask is is for any veteran listening that's aspiring to go through an acquisition process or might be in that process right now, what advice would you give about um, going through that po- process of having someone buy this company that you've spent years building? Yeah, you know, it's it, what was really important for us is that we never planned on an acquisition. And I think that's really, really critical. The first thing we learned in negotiations class is you always have to have an alternative. And we wanted to make sure that we were on a path to be able to have and maintain a standalone business uh, based on the set of investments and the like that we were that we had brought on board, and I think we were we were always uh, open to having those kind of partnership and acquisition discussions, but we we never thought of it as an imperative. And as a consequence, when we were successful in proving the technology, it was the acquisition was really just an opportunistic um, being able to take advantage of of something that was there and was clearly the right call for us at the time. Um, You know, I I think one thing I've learned in in the process of of starting a company is the moment that we took our first dollar as a a fledgling startup, we we started working for somebody else. And, And really our investors, you know, they made a big bet on us. They took a lot of risk based on a few folks with a few PowerPoint charts. And as a consequence, you know, we were always working for them and, and under the gun, un, under a ticking clock. And, you know, I think we, we soon realized that upon acquisition, all we were doing is shifting who our bosses were and that we were still under, under the gun, still under this, this ticking clock to be able to deliver, to be able to create a, a standalone business. And it's just the, the names may change, but the, the expectations and the, the guidance and the uh, pressures, I think, still remain for us, uh, even post-acquisition. Although it certainly is nice to have uh, the Google bikes and the bean bags and the uh, the nice food every day. <laughs> That's all, and and Google's resources behind all the work that you're doing, I'm sure, is is pretty uh, pretty awesome as well. Absolutely. Um, you know, maybe just a couple, um, before I turn over to you, just to kind of cover anything we've missed a couple, just general military questions I like to ask is, um, you know, I think that the military in so many ways helps prepare people and puts them ahead and forms really good, healthy, positive habits. I'm wondering, were there any bad habits that you had to break from the military or any habits that you had to break to be successful on the civilian side? Well, we already talked about the one, about how the military teaches every, all of us to be right every time. And, and therefore, that it's really that's constraining in the civilian and the business world. Um, I think another really challenging aspect in my transition, and I still struggle with this, is in the military, everybody's on the same team. Everybody has a shared mission. Everyone's working towards, you know, basically the this, this same general goal of defending our nation's borders. And in the business world, I soon realized that is not the case. These sort of incentives are not aligned. Everyone is out for for themselves and the entity that they're representing. And in many cases, that is in direct opposition or orthogonal to to what I was working towards. And that was a real challenge for me to to shift that thinking to make to realize that hey, um, you know, these people may not be or almost certainly are acting in my best interest. In fact, my interest and theirs are your polar opposites. So I was going to ask about entrepreneurship and especially for people on active duty who are getting out, who are trying to figure out which, which career path to start down. Yeah. Do you have any thoughts on, um, indications that they might be well suited to entrepreneurship and really thrive here as well as indications that this might not be ideal for them. And, and as part of that too, any thoughts on, on timing of whether it's better to, you know, pursue advanced degree, which you've already spoken to a little bit, or get more time in industry or do it right away, just kind of a sense of, of how they might figure out if this is the right thing for them. Yeah, I think in general, 
Uh, advanced degrees in business schools are great for people that don't know what we want to do. Uh, my, my one piece of advice would be if anyone has an inkling of something they want to go try and do, it's best to just VFR direct, go do that. Go, go see about that idea, about that thesis that you've built about what you want to do with your life. And that's the easiest way. Instead of trying to triangulate around it, just, just go for it and see if it sticks, see if it works. And as soon as you realize it doesn't, we can just, we just cross it off the list and move on and, and, and adjust that thesis to, to the, next, the next idea, the next possible career path. Uh, I, I'm a big fan of just being direct and, and trying to figure things out by trial and error because it just gets to the, what's next and what's potentially more optimal that much faster. Yeah, I love that. I mean, it's such a more efficient way to to figure it out and um, just to dive in and, and get um, get a feel for whether you like it or not, because there's no way to really approximate that without the direct experience. Yeah, I mean, let's be honest. The advanced degrees are just procrastination. <laughs> I right? love it. Yeah, yeah. Because it means we don't have the skills, but more likely don't have the idea or direction. Uh, so we we extend the optionality of being able to figure out what to do by – uh, a, a couple years worth of, of a variety of experiences. That's awesome. Well, I, I always like to, to save the chunk at the end to um, just turn it over to you. I mean, you've, you've answered a lot of great questions and, and provided a lot of in, incredible insight on your own story. Um, knowing that you have an audience of active duty personnel and veterans who have already transitioned, what other advice would you want to give them or, or what else would you like to share either personally or professionally or both? Yeah, I think what I realized in, in, in my career path is that there's a tremendously large network out there of fellow vets and additional folks who support and believe in, in people like us. And some are very easy to track down. Some like yourself are you know even prolific in terms of being able to connect with, but some are hard. Um, most everyone's going to be receptive, but maybe are not that uh, easy to track down. In, in my career search, especially related to my startup, I, I was the one who was proactive. I f- tried to ferret out as many people and advice as I, as I could. And in doing so, I, back to what I was saying before, I found it so, so important to walk in to every conversation with a thesis. Here's what I want to do. And, and that, al- that allowed me to engage and allowed the persons that I was talking to to be able to wrap their head around how they might be able to help who they might be able to contact me with, what kind of advice to give. Um, Having it be very um, directed and focused on this idea of what I wanted to do. Now, that's scary sometimes because maybe what I wanted to do was just stupid, um, but at least this was a way to confirm or deny and allow me to adjust or or scratch things off the list. Um, but But I found that I had to be proactive. I had to ask. And not only that, what I found to be super, it seems very, very tactical. But at the end of every conversation, I always said, who else should I be talking to? And it turns out that the really the best and most fruitful conversations for me were never the first ones, were never the cold call. It was that third, second, third, fourth degree of Kevin Bacon separation of someone I got connected to that really had an insight or, you know, was able to really help me in a substantial way. And we're vets. Everyone's going to answer the phone. Everyone's going to answer the email. We just got to find the folks and make the ask and have the thesis. Well, John, this is awesome. I I appreciate your taking the time to speak with me and share your story. And I appreciate just the role model you're being for other veterans of someone who has um, taken considerable risk and gone after uh, just building a dream of, of literally launching satellites into space. And so I appreciate the um, example you set for other veterans of what any veteran can do, that they can go after something that seems impossible and just take it milestone by milestone, and they could uh, achieve something that changes the world and uh, changes the lives of those around them. So thank you for that. You're welcome, Justin. This has been fun. Surface, surface, surface. <laughs> Beyond the Uniform is written and produced by me, Justin Asiri, with the help from our Chief of Staff, Steve Bain, our Editor, Lex Brown, and our Head of Social Media, Janelle Hanf. We are an all-volunteer organization and would greatly appreciate your help in any of the following ways. First of all, spread the word. 
Beyond the Uniform has over 380 podcast episodes and 15 on-demand webinars, all offered for free. Help us spread the word on social media, at military bases, or whatever gets this resource in front of the men and women who need it. Positive reviews on iTunes go a long way towards this as well. Second of all, sponsorship. Beyond the Uniform relies on sponsorship to keep us going. There is so much more we'd like to do, but just don't have nearly the resources to do it. If you know of a company that would advertise in any way with Beyond the Uniform, please send them our way. Third of all, donations. If you're in a financial position to donate, you can find more information on the support section of our website. At our website, beyondtheuniform.org, you'll find over 380 episodes categorized by industry, functional role, and more. You'll also find both free and for-purchase resources that take a deeper dive on topics related to career growth. Thank you for your support as we aim to help members of the military and their families thrive in their post-military career in life.